The Epic of Gilgamesh is the oldest known tale in mankind's history, a grand story of what is believed to have been a real king deified after his death. The monarch of Uruk went on grand adventures beside the wild man Enkidu and was occasionally backed up by the sun god Utu. This story is among the most important in mankind's history, on the same level or higher than the likes of the Epic of Beowulf. With that said, just how strong is Gilgamesh? There are many videos on how powerful his fate counterpart is, and for the sake of not getting into it and avoiding a common shitstorm, the discussion of how strong he is will be completely irrelevant here. Please don't bring up the fate version. We are focusing solely on the figure of ancient Sumerian and Babylonian mythology, and there will be a few ground rules I will lay out here. 1. We will be combining the Sumerian Bilgamesh and the Babylonian Gilgamesh. Both represent the exact same deified version of the same figure, and the differences really aren't major between them, with only a few changes in different contexts. The Babylonian Epic of Gilgamesh is basically just a translation and adaptation of the Sumerian poems. 2. For this we will need to look at the cosmology of Mesopotamian mythology, and for that we will be looking at the ancient Sumerian and Babylonian structures of the cosmology, but I will be avoiding anything that is from Assyrian Christianity. That is a still practiced religious belief, and I'm not here to tell people how strong their religious practices are. Though if you do happen to be one of the few people out there who may still follow the old religions of Mesopotamia, uh, what a strange world we live in that you happen to end up here. I'd recommend clicking off if you don't want to see exactly what I just said. 3. We will be tackling Gilgamesh both in a more conservative standing on his power and going all out with the highest interpretations. I won't try to push you one way or another, at least not any more than I would go. I'm just here to present the evidence. If I've misinterpreted anything in these stories, please let me know. I'll investigate further if I have time. For this, I'm using both the Andrew, George, and Maureen Kovacs translations of the Epic of Gilgamesh, because they're the two I could easily find in full. But first, as I'm not sure everyone knows exactly the story of this Gilgamesh, I guess I'll tell you a tale. We begin at the conception of Gilgamesh. The divine Nudamid or Enki crafted the most handsome man in the world. Two thirds god and one third man, he was the son of Holy Lugalbanda, king of Uruk, and Ninsun, the goddess of wild cows who possessed immense wisdom. During his time as king, Gilgamesh had a dream that told him of a man who would arrive equaling his strength. The wild man Enkidu, the gods made after the people of Uruk, begged for their king's humbling. Gilgamesh would send the prostitute Shamhar to tame him, and bring him to him. Upon meeting, the two engaged in a wrestling match, and Gilgamesh stood the winner. So impressed with Enkidu's strength that the two became close friends akin to brothers. The two would go on adventures together, most notably the following. Gilgamesh and Enkidu, aided by Utu, traveled the seven mountains of the Cedar Forest to kill the monster Humbaba. Enkidu at one point entered the underworld to retrieve his friend's belongings, and was captured for his transgressions, and the two would eventually slay the Bull of Heaven, sent by the goddess Ishtar to destroy Uruk and Gilgamesh. Afterwards, the gods chose Enki to die as a result of this ultimate transgression, and he would fall of illness. Afraid of his own death, grieving, and mourning his closest friends falling, Gilgamesh embarked on a great journey for immortality, crossing the divine Elwise Siriri, the ferryman of gods Ushunabi, the twelve knights of darkness, and at last Utnapishtim, the man who survived the flooding of the world and was granted immortality. He told Gilgamesh that to be immortal, he would need to defy sleep, but Gilgamesh could not. He then told him to fetch a root that would restore youth, but after doing so, Gilgamesh's celebratory swim results in a snake stealing it. But by the end, Gilgamesh finds peace and acceptance towards death, and can live with the knowledge of its inevitability. That is the story of the Epic of Gilgamesh, but there are others of the Sumerian Bilgames, which I will mention later. For now, let us talk about this character's power, beginning with its arsenal and abilities. Despite what one might assume from his most well-known depiction, Gilgamesh actually doesn't have much on him. In one translation of his battle with Enkidu, he is described as having a javelin, but everywhere else he carries with him nothing but an axe and a dirk, sometimes aided by a shield. Gilgamesh carries 10 talents worth of daggers. For context, one talent corresponds to 30.2 kilograms, about the weight of a sea otter. Gilgamesh carries either multiple daggers that add up to 300 kilograms, or one dagger that heavy. I want to say this is a mistranslation, but literally every translation I find uses Sumerian talents in that way. Gilgamesh's axe, too, is made of bronze and weighs 7 talons, up to 210 kilograms. For an axe, that's really heavy. But that's also all he has on him, a dirk, an axe, a shield, and sometimes a javelin. Gilgamesh doesn't tend to have many insane abilities, but there are a few of note. First of all, Gilgamesh possesses the totality of knowledge of all, granted to him from Anu. However, this is pretty vague, and it's more likely this is something he gets after the conclusion of the epic. This section is describing Gilgamesh after his story is completed, after he has seen everything and experienced all things, and brought information of before the Flood. The last one is important for context, because the epic ends right after he has met Utnapishtim, who is the one who has that knowledge. 
so the claim that he has this knowledge is vague at best. What we do know that isn't vague, however, is that Gilgamesh tends to have prophetic dreams, doing so both warning him of the coming of Enkidu and telling him of his victory over Humbaba, though he needs help interpreting them. Once he has the totality of knowledge, though, he probably doesn't need that help anymore. His most vague ability is his Dread Aura. Dread Auras are not something that are well defined in Sumerian text. It's possible this is referring to Melamu, a form of divine radiance, which would make sense as he is two-thirds divine, and using it he overwhelms the young and old of the city of Kulab. However, we don't know much else of what it does. We can get an idea from Hubaba potentially, who in the Sumerian myth possesses seven Dread Auras, of which he can use to put Gilgamesh to sleep and scare off seven constellations. Gilgamesh eventually claims his seven auras, but they are taken by Enki and distributed among mankind. It's possible that the auras were stand in for Mez, or Mez, a, a form of power that is possessed by the gods of Uruk, and generally in Mesopotamia. The reason I bring this up is that the Mez are also connected to physical objects, which is the same with the Dread Auras Humbaba wields. The two characters who have Dread Auras that I know of are Gilgamesh and Humbaba, who are both somewhat divine. Anyway, even though he loses the seven Dread Auras of Humbaba, he still holds a single one himself. Other than that, Gilgamesh doesn't have much else. He is resistant to paralysis, fire, and maybe death manipulation based on his venture against Humbaba. It's described that Humbaba's breath is death and his mouth is fire, and Gilgamesh survives being in the presence of both. He also walks into the forest sea to find, despite the fact that it paralyzes those who walk in. However, he explicitly does not resist sleep manipulation, and was put to sleep by Humbaba's Dread Aura. So Gilgamesh really isn't holding much in terms of incredible powers, with two potentially impressive things that are just super vague, not many resistances, and one very clear power that is basically useless. But that's fine, Gilgamesh is mostly a brawler and wrestler anyway, so here we get to the big thing. How physically strong is Gilgamesh? Gilgamesh is, to put it lightly, very strong. Early on in the story, he and Enkidu's power both are described as equal to the meteor of Enki. Meteorites in Sumerian mythology tend to be capable of obliterating entire cities. For instance, on the Sumerian tablet K8538, a meteorological impact capable of creating a 4.2 killer year event is described, a supposed century-long climate disaster. Later on in his battle with the beast Humbaba, it is mentioned that he flattened mountains in the past, and during the battle, the resulting force of the three fighters shattered Mount Sirion and Lebanon. Mount Sirion is a mountain cluster and Mount Lebanon is 170 kilometers long and a mountain range that spans the entirety of Lebanon. Meaning Gilgamesh is easily strong enough to destroy an entire mountain range, shattering and flattening it with his divine strength. But more than that, he even goes on to fight against the Bull of Heaven. The Bull of Heaven is a creature brought by the goddess Ishtar or Ninana depending on the version. She either brought it after Gilgamesh denied her sexual advances on him, or just for the hell of it I guess. The bull's snorts create holes in the ground large enough for 200 people to fall in, and just releasing him will cause years of famine. He's so large in fact that despite many depictions visually making him small, he's described as filling up all of Uruk, but he's probably even larger. For you see, many Assyriologists deem that the Bull of Heaven is the same as the constellation Taurus, which has 19 stars within it. Meaning for Gilgamesh to not only kill but also hold in place and overpower the Bull of Heaven, he'd likely have to be more powerful than the combined energy of 19 stars. And this is not entirely inconsistent, for in the original tale of Humbaba, it is described that Utu gave Gilgamesh seven guardians, of which are supposedly meant to be constellations. These being uh, a griffin, a cobra, a, a dragon, something that spits fire, so a gamera, a serpent, a torrent, and something that blasts lightning. And these are all defeated in one breath by Humbaba, and they're not willing to fight him. Even if you would assume this is because of Humbaba's Dread Aura, then Gilgamesh's own Dread Aura would downscale seven times below Humbaba, or equivalent to a single constellation. So Gilgamesh most likely is stronger than an entire constellation. But that's not the limit, because we're now going to look at the highest possible arguments you can make for Gilgamesh. In the Epic of Gilgamesh, it is said, who among even the Igigi gods can confront him in relation to Humbaba? Which implies that Humbaba's power is at least superior to some of the Igigi gods. The Yagigi are a vague set of entities, which depending on context can either refer to the Anunnaki gods, or the servants of the Anunnaki. I'll present you the arguments for and against either interpretation within the context of the Epic of Gilgamesh. Reasons the Yagigi are the Anunnaki The Yagigi are explicitly referred to as gods, 
which only makes sense if they are the Anunnaki. For if they aren't, then they're not gods, they're just the servants of gods that predated mankind. Additionally, Enlil is described as being furious with the Igi gods for what they did during the Flood Myth. During the Flood Myth, the gods who acted included the likes of Enki, who is one in the Anunnaki. Reasons the Igigi are not the Anunnaki In the epic, the Anunnaki are also referred to, and while they are never specifically referred to as separate and distinct from the Igigi mentioned prior, it is noteworthy that both names are used at different points. Additionally, the Anunnaki are described as lying in a land on fire, while the Igigi fought against that. In my opinion, I think the Igigi in this story refer to some of the Anunnaki, but not necessarily all of them, like Enlil who is clearly separate. But as the Igigi are gods in this tale, they are most likely some. But as the Igigi, but as the Igigi are gods in this tale, they are most likely some of the Anunnaki. The Anunnaki, for those who aren't aware, refer to just generally the gods of Mesopotamia, and is incredibly vague as to who they are there. But basically, all the gods, with the exception of some of the highest gods and Ninurta, should count as Anunnaki. Gilgamesh thus should be within the range of some of the Anunnaki. And this is his entire discussion with Ishtar. Ishtar was not willing to actually deal with Gilgamesh herself and ran off when she was disgraced. This is important because other times she is disrespected, such as when she was disrespected by the entirety of Mount Ebi, she tends to just blow away whatever is doing it to her. But Gilgamesh was not someone she was willing to put up arms against. She also tends to do this sort of thing to anyone who denies her advances, as Gilgamesh even notes in the story, so Gilgamesh is likely someone that Ishtar is not willing to fight. At least, Ishtar when she isn't wielding all the mares of Enki, just base Ishtar. It doesn't hurt that in the story of Inanna and the Hulubu tree, Inanna by the way being uh, another name for Ishtar, she requires the help of Gilgamesh to defeat some monsters, so at the very least she has directly needed his help to stop creatures that she wasn't strong enough to. So how strong is Ishtar? Well, Ishtar is the manifestation of the planet Venus and equal to Utu who is the sun. She also brought the Bull of Heaven to Earth from the sky. Even when she was just born, Enlil blessed her with the ability to shake the heavens. Oh, this reminds me, one thing I should mention now that we're talking about the gods is that they basically all have the capacity to manipulate fate and use transmutation. Yet, they don't even attempt that power on Gilgamesh, so presumably if Ishtar really wanted to get rid of him and could use those powers to, then she would have. But she didn't, meaning Gilgamesh most likely has some resistance to both fate manipulation and transmutation. But Ishtar is not the most powerful Anunnaki. If we were to compare Gilgamesh to the likes of Enki, he would hold power equivalent to half of all the stars in the night sky. But this would be stretching, I think Enki is definitely more powerful than Gilgamesh. With that said, the constellations are meant to be the handwriting of the gods. So if Gilgamesh is comparable to Ishtar, he's likely more powerful than Enki's handwriting. And that handwriting is all those stars. But none of that really seems to boost Gilgamesh that high up, he's just higher into busting multiple stars. Well, this is where we get to the next bit. In the tale Anzu and the Tablet of the Destinies, the god Ninurta is described as having taken up the divine powers of the mountains, which are as heavy as heaven. This would mean that mountains in Sumer weigh as much as heaven itself. Now this is not to say that they are as powerful as heaven, because obviously they're not, but this would mean mountains are insanely massive in terms of the, the amount of mass packed into them. Gilgamesh shattered two entire mountain ranges with his punches. If we were to take this claim as literally as possible, these mountains are no joke. Now in Sumerian cosmology, the world is set up as such. At the bottom you have Ikala or Kur, the underworld. Above that is the flat disk of Earth. Above that is the first layer of heaven, which contains the entire night sky. It would stand to reason that this layer of heaven reaches the boundary of what we consider the observable universe, as it contains all the stars in the sky and reaches beyond them. Above that is complicated. See, in all models that exist, it only describes three layers, the above one being the layer of the lesser gods, and the top layer being the one actually referred to as heaven of heaven. But there are actually seven layers in Sumerian belief, along with seven earths, seven Anunnaki, and seven demons. There's actually a phrase commonly used in Sumer that refers to the seven heavens. Now, heaven in Sumerian terms refers to all of these layers up to the realm of the gods with Enki, meaning these mountains could weigh as much as layers that exist seven times larger than our universe. The equivalent mass of that would be 93 times the mass of the universe we live in. Meaning Gilgamesh destroyed two mountain ranges of which each mountain is equivalent to that. At the very least, even if not all mountains are that heavy, Mount Ebi most likely is due to its importance and Ishtar was able to level it. 
Now, if you use this interpretation, Gilgamesh destroying two mountains would be equivalent to 186 universes. But at the highest interpretation, if we were to say that Mount Lebanon refers to only one quarter of all mountains in Lebanon, which I doubt, I think Mount Lebanon would have more than just a quarter in it, but anyway, Gilgamesh at his strongest could wield the power to destroy the universe 77,000 times over. Now, at the very least, just general universe level would not necessarily be an outlier, as in the story Lugalbanda and the Anzu Bird, the Anzu Bird is described as able to hold the heavens in his hand. The Anzu Bird actually featured in a previously mentioned story, Inanna and the Hulupu Tree, as the Thunder Bird. Anzu actually flees from Gilgamesh, implying that Gilgamesh is more than capable of killing the Anzu Bird if he wants. Being comparable to the Anzu Bird, or at least a threat to it, would mean he would be equal to something that can casually hold 93 universes worth of weight in its hand. With that in mind, I feel like some people might think I'm trying to say that Ninurta and Gilgamesh are comparable, but no. Gilgamesh would get absolutely destroyed by Ninurta. Someone like Ishtar, who Gilgamesh is probably comparable to, can destroy the gates of Kerr, but Ninurta can destroy all of Kerr. He's pretty handily the most powerful god and being in all of Suma, and the only way to beat him would be to basically have all the me- me-, me, me, me all the mes in it. I, this word is just confusing because I want to say mees. All the powers necessary to overcome his ridiculous strength. I'm only using this statement because it exists. So those are your options. At the low end, Gilgamesh is able to shatter mountain ranges, but I think constellation level is very reasonable. I also think universal, or 93 times universal, using the cosmology of, well, Suma, is fair. And the highest interpretation with the mountain statement could range from 186 to 77,000 times universal. Which, if you're wondering, would not make him stronger than the gods like Enki and Enlil, as they are firmly above him at their best, as would be Marduk, Tiamat, and basically every other celestial being like that. There is a god that shatters mountain ranges too, so this wouldn't be an inconsistent thing that breaks the rules, it just means that all mountain feats are more impressive due to Sumerian cosmology. Anyway, there is one last category to go through. Gilgamesh doesn't have many speed feats himself, but the most important thing is that both he and the Sumerian poem and Enkidu in the Babylonian epic were capable of tagging Ishtar slash Inanna with a leg torn from the Bull of Heaven, meaning they were able to throw this leg faster than Inanna could dodge. Now, Ishtar is more than capable of reacting while traveling at full speed, meaning most likely that Enkidu and Gilgamesh can throw attacks faster than someone with her level of reaction speed can respond to. At the low end, Ishtar was able to bring the Bull of Heaven to Earth from the sky, where it's described to live and eat from. The furthest star of Taurus, HIP 21533, is 108,000 light years away from the Sun. So if we were to say it took her a year to travel that distance, which is pretty unlikely given how quickly she seemed to bring it, she'd still be flying at 108,000 times the speed of light. Even further than that, she can just casually travel from the heaven of heavens to Earth within the span of... Well, we don't know for sure, but it tends not to take very long. To travel a distance equivalent to seven observable universes within a single year, She'd be traveling at 97 quintillion, 653 quadrillion, 696 trillion times the speed of light. And she's likely much faster than even that, as that would assume she takes a full year to get to and fro. That is insane speed, and Gilgamesh was able to smack her with a leg casually and send her flying before she could respond. If you really want, you could look into the claim that Inanna's torch can light up all the corners of the universe, but unless that means her general light that she produces, which is possible, I don't see how that would be scalable. I'm pretty sure the light is just coming off of her at all times, which would not be any more scalable than to say you punching a flashlight makes you as fast as the light that's coming out of it. As such, that gives us the power of Gilgamesh. He is at least as strong as the constellation, and most likely over 93 times more powerful than the universe with scaling to the Anzu bird, and even higher with the mountain claim. He's fast enough to scale to 97 quintillion times the speed of light and possesses a vague dread aura and all knowledge there is. Am I forgetting something? In the story of the death of Gilgamesh, it is described that once Gilgamesh dies, he will become the governor of Kerr, a lesser member of the Anunnaki gods and chief of the Shades. He shall pass judgment on the dead, and hold equal weight with his words to Dumuzid and Ningishzida, making his judgments just below those of Ereshkigal and Nergal, the highest ranking gods of death in Mesopotamia. With the power to match Ishtar who could shatter the gates of hell, it is completely possible that Gilgamesh, if he wished, could destroy the Seven Gates of Kerr and resurrect himself after death. You might be asking, why didn't he just do that and come back to life then? Well, the answer is simple, and one of the most important lessons in the Epic of Gilgamesh. The Epic of Gilgamesh is many things, and one of them is a story about living life to its fullest. Everyone, be they a normal member of society or the highest king of the exalted world, will be faced with death, with grief, with 
morning. Everyone will have someone they love who will be lost one day, and for as important as it is to grieve and remember them, you should not allow yourself to be consumed by their passing. Those who are consumed too much and broken by the death of their loved ones are bound to find failure until they can restore themselves. For they're no longer living a life, they are just wading through the despair of death. What's important in this life is to be able to live it as much as you can, to be able to come to accept that all things are fleeting, nothing on earth stays forever, but none of your deeds are in vain. Sometimes the finality of things is what can give them value. So live the time you have with your loved ones, with your friends, with your family, those who came before and those who will continue after, while you still can. It won't last forever, but that just means the time you do spend is more important than anything else. That is the lesson, or at least the main one I took, from the Epic of Gilgamesh. Don't let yourself be consumed with the fear of the inevitable. Use the inevitable as context to give more meaning to your life. The hardest part of life is living it, but that's also what makes it so special. Hey, we're done with that video. I hope you guys enjoyed. Uh, I doubt this one was one that anyone expected me to do, apart from the people I told. Um, yeah, I thought it was it was interesting, like, as a fan of the story of the Epic of Gilgamesh and, like, someone who, uh, has kind of wanted to go back to doing some of these, like, power skin videos and stuff nobody talks about. Um, I was planning to do another heavy metal one after Eddie the Head, but, uh, my options were either, like, really small or had a full-length movie that I have not watched yet and don't have the time to watch right now. So I went ahead and just, like, did some reading in my off time and sort of compiled together this from the Epic of Gilgamesh and the other things. Um, hope you guys enjoyed. Uh, and thank you to all my patrons who are currently scrolling by on screen right now. Their support is amazing. You guys, if you want, you can go to the description and you'll be able to find a link to my Patreon where you can support me if you want. You'll get access to my Patreon-only Discord, uh, exclusive videos, and uh, occasionally bloopers whenever I put them out. Uh, but while we're here, let's talk about the fucking quotes that the Discord wants me to say. Which is like the, the big reward everyone is cashing in on, making me say incredibly stupid bullshit. So let's just see what they have for me this time, and if I'm going to regret it again. GARBAGE DAY! Supercalifragilisticexpialidocious. Did I, get, did I say that right? I, I don't usually say that very often. I have acquired the power cosmic, and now I will proceed to fuck your mum! I don't really know, I don't, I don't want people using my voice to do this. But that, that's what concerns me. Take the voice line out of context and to whatever you want. That concerns me. So instead, I'm gonna say it as Katsuki Bakugo. I'd go to school if this was the uniform, these were the books, this was the bus, this was the teacher! Think about it. If you had a jury that was as powerful as Mario, would you even want him? Well, my name is Skylar White, yo. That's probably viewing a bit too close for Biff to be happy with that. Calif California girls, we are unforgettable. That feels like it's a reference to something I don't get. <laughs> I kind of don't want to say this, I just want to like leave it on screen so people can read it of their own accord. I don't know why. You're a boy in a man's world. And I'm a man who loves to play with boys. <laughs> Help out a little Akuna Matata, Baba Yaga. Okay, that was all of them. <laughs> um, I hope you guys enjoyed uh, this video. Uh, I, I will be leaving now, and I will be coming back probably, probably with, uh, I don't know, maybe the third mission of Space Hulk. I recently learnt, though not with any surprise, I kind of suspected, that uh, YouTube is not showing any of my subscribers really, the the, the Nemesis board rank, the board game videos we do. Um, some people just don't know we do them. Uh, so if you guys want, you can just check my recent uploads, and I'll probably put a playlist up. Uh, of all the Nemesis board rank episodes, which is where me and the lads will just sit down and play a board game. Currently playing Space Hulk. Um, I really need a hiccup right now. Uh, bye! <laughs>